Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Jan. It's 11 o'clock and let's get started. My name is Jan Schmitz from the Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. It's January 26 and thank you all for attending our weekly Aging with Pride discussion group for the two SLGBTQTIA plus seniors and their allies. Thank you too to our partner SAGE and the Pride Center of Edmonton. Before I introduce our speaker, I must acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and we respect the histories, languages and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our lives. I must let you know that this session will be recorded for future use on our YouTube channel. If you don't wish your image to be recorded, please close your video feed. And now, and with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our speaker. S.J. Lafayette, he, him, is a QT BIPOC, born and raised in Treaty 6 territory. He is passionate about community service and has been with the Pride Center of Edmonton since September of 2020. He currently holds the role, role, holds the role of executive director. Over to you, S.J. <clears throat> Well, hello, folks. Very nice to see you and meet you. I uh, was really looking forward to this time to connect uh, with people in the community. My job makes it often, Michael and I were actually just talking about wanting to connect with each other and being busy people. It's, it can be difficult sometimes to get out and connect. And um, that's really the reason why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. So um, well, I hope to have uh, leave a lot of time just to chat and interact, hopefully be a small group so we can do that. So I'm going to start with just giving you a bit more of a thorough uh, information or background about my, my history and then how I connected with the Pride Center. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we're currently doing at the Pride Center and then where we're moving and open it up for questions. So as Jan said, uh, my name is SJ Lafayette. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the current acting or current executive director of the Pride Center of Edmonton. I was born um, in Saskatchewan in a little, little town called Rosetown. Um, and I spent my first few years, two years in um, on a family farm situated in between Fisk and Rosetown, if you're familiar with the area. Um, I am a trans man. And um, that piece of my identity is definitely influenced, I think, most of my decisions and um, kind of what led me to the Pride Center today. So being a member of the queer community, that might seem like that makes sense. But um, as I talk more about my journey, um, it, it's really integral to how I ended up here in 2020. So I'll get I'll get there. Um, being trans, I was one of those people that was aware of my my transness from my earliest formative memories. I don't ever remember a time not being aware of my gender identity. And so that really impacted a lot of my familial relations. Um, and a lot of the decisions, really sort of any decision I ever made, gender took up so much real estate in my, my memory. So I was born in 1980, so I'm 42 years old. Um, you're all, you know, I imagine you're all adults at that time. So it's, we'd made a lot of progressions within um, the 2S LGBTQ struggle, but it was still a very different time than it is today. So as I was growing up, it was very isolated. There wasn't, other than the rare reference in um, like a sitcom, some crude reference to like a transsexual, there was really no representation. It wasn't until the 90s that I think there was a lot more discussion and the word even transgender or it was transgendered at that time was available. Um, so it was a really lonely journey. Um, and as I said, it, gender took up so much space. So like I said, I was born in um, Saskatchewan. My parents divorced when I was two. And so when they divorced, I left Saskatchewan and I um, lived with my grandparents. And I didn't actually have much contact with my dad's side of the family. And that was actually because I knew, I knew about my gender identity. And, and when I was young, it was just that I'm a boy, that's it. And um, at some point I realized that there was a thing called a sex change. And so it was quite little when I, when I learned that word and I went, oh, that's what I'm gonna have to do. And in my little brain, I thought, 
if that's what I'm going to do, my family's not going to accept me. So I'm not going to be able to have a relationship with my dad's side of the family. So my father continued to try to have a relationship with me when I was a child. Um, and I was very resistant to that, resistant to that. And it wasn't actually until my early 20s that I got reconnected back to my dad's side of the family. Um, so when I I'll fast forward kind of into my early 20s um, or my late teens, because of my awareness around my gender identity, um, and I did fortunately have a really affirming mom and my grandparents were really affirming, I was able to medically transition pretty young, which is something that was important to me. So I started my medical transition when I was 17. Um, and that meant by my early 20s, I was able to live quite comfortably presenting as a male. Um, and what that meant was I sort of, the, my 20s onward were a lot of dealing with, I, I think the trauma of growing up in a world that doesn't recognize, didn't recognize gender variance. Um, and the fact that we as human beings were so much more than our gender identity or sexual orientation. And now that I've reflected over the years and done lots of therapy, I, my formative years were really impacted by this disproportionate amount of space that gender took up. It was the only thing that really mattered. So um, I was really involved in sports up until when I hit puberty. And then I, I dropped out of all sports because it was just too painful to have to uh, face my, my being. I, at the time, there weren't many integrated um, sports opportunities. So I would have had to play on a girls team and I couldn't handle that. Doing um, in school things like band or any extracurricular activities, still the case today, you're, if your gender is incongruent with what people perceive, you're constantly having it thrown in your face. So it just, it was too painful to really operate in the outside world in any sort of extracurricular activity. So my 20s, fast forwarding to my 20s, I, I unintentionally went in the closet. Um, testosterone is really powerful. So I wasn't misgendered. I was just perceived as a cisgendered male. Um, and so I, I spent my 20s and my early 30s doing a lot of healing. And I, like I said, I didn't intentionally go in the closet. It was just people make assumptions and I wasn't going to be coming out to everybody. So unless it was necessary, I didn't really come out. Um, and so in my early, in my, in my early thirties, I went into the trades, um, just because I needed to make some more money. I did a number of jobs before that. I did some university, um, but I really needed to have a stable income and I became an electrician and I did that, um, up until, 2020. And that's what gets me to the Pride Center. So 2020 hit and it was a really, it was a really pivotal year for me. It was COVID-19. So we all were affected by that. So there was, I think many people really reflected on um, where they were, the decisions that they were making, what works in life, what doesn't. It was a very reflective time for, I think, many people. That's been a common narrative that I've heard. Um, for me, it was the year I turned 40 and I didn't really think it would have a huge impact. I've, I've never had hangups about around ages uh, or around age or aging. I've actually, as a side note, as a kid, I looked forward to being an old man. I couldn't wait to be an old man. So I, I didn't think 40 would really hit me because it is still relatively young, um, but it is a milestone year. So it actually was significant for me. My mom also died when I was 42. And so there was this kind of piece of me that went, uh, if I was my mom, I'd have two years left. Well, what am I doing with my life? Um, it was the year of Black Lives Matter. And for me, that was significant because um, my dad, for a long time, I, I thought they were just black, but I've recently learned in the last year that we have a lot of indigenous heritage um, and it was hidden because black folks were treated better than indigenous people. But that's that's kind of a side piece. Um, so at that time, I thought I was, I've always identified as biracial up until relatively recently. And because I didn't spend time with my uh, dad's side of the family when I was younger, 
um, I had never really connected a lot with my black side of the family, or at least in the formative years, I'd have, you know, last 20 years or so connecting with my dad's side of the family, but it's, I missed a big chunk. So I've never been super close with them. Um, and I really didn't really realize until all the Black Lives Matter uh, protests happened, how much I hadn't explored and how much sort of com internal conflict and issues related to um, being at that time, I thought biracial. Um, so I was reflective about that. And then also a lot of institutionalized racism that I, I didn't even really think about. And as I started to learn more about how oppression works and how systemic racism works, it had all these moments of being like, oh, I think that happened. That was a result of racism. Um, so I, I started to go through a bit of an existential crisis and go into quite a deep depression. And I said, I've got to make some significant changes. And one of the things I've been really been struggling with was work. Um, I really like working with my hands and there's many elements I liked about working in the trades, but anybody that's familiar with the trades probably understands they're an incredibly toxic environment. Aside from being queer and racialized, um, I just think that there's many elements of the way the trades operate um, are, I think it's it's destructive, destructive and harmful for really everybody, regardless of your identity. So I, I, I was becoming increasingly unhappy and I happened to work at probably the worst site I'd ever worked with. I had the foreman who was the worst in terms of racism, misogyny, he was a loose cannon. He was going through, I think, a mental health crisis himself. So he was he was abusive to um, his workers, and we were working on a very remote site as well, too. So it was at that time I decided I I have to leave. And when I made that decision, I hadn't actually quit my job, but um, I was just waiting to talk to my foreman because I did like um, this was the last I was transferred jobs, and this was the last foreman I had. I quite liked him, so I just wanted to give him a face to face. Um, uh, re um, what's the word? Um, what do you say? What's it called when you you say you're leaving a job? Exit, Resign. exit Resign. interview. Exit interview. Yeah. Oh, I would love to have an exit interview. We didn't do those in the trades. Resign. That was the word I was looking for. I wanted to resign face to face. Um, so I was out walking my dog, and I ran into that. At that time, it was the um, chair of the Pride Center, and we just. We ended up talking. I wasn't close to this person, but we we knew each other through different circles. And they asked what I do for work. And I told them, and I said, I'm actually thinking of leaving. And they had said, oh, we're hiring at the Pride Center. You should quit and come apply. And I thought, well, it's a totally different field. I know nothing about, you know, at the, that time it was the ED position, um, but I was open to anything. So I quit. And then I applied um, and then I was hired as the operations manager. And I worked as the operations manager until last, last February. And then I was the interim ED. And then I was moved into the uh, permanent position of ED in October. So that's kind of the, that's the Coles Notes version of what got me here. Um, but I should say when I decided to apply to the Pride Center, it really aligned with that internal, um, reflection. It wasn't that I just wanted a new job. I also thought, to me, it makes sense that the work that we do, if we have the ability to, I know not everybody does, but if you have the privilege and the uh, freedom to do this, it makes sense that to me that work is is service. I, I really think that the world where we look work a lot better, if no matter what the field was, we approached it from a place of service and then you know, the, the payback is that you get reasonably compensated. I think everybody should be able to be paid beyond a living wage for what they do. But the primary impetus is you're doing work of service and that you have skills that can help uplift and help community. So it really, it made sense to me coming to the Pride Center. Um, I'm, I have, I do have a lot of skills that I could offer. And I also, in terms of um, the 2S LGBTQI community, there's so much trauma, as I'm sure you're familiar with, within members of our community. So having people that can bring lived experience, I've done a lot of therapy, I've done a lot of healing, and I could bring some stability and support to the organization really, really was appealing to me. 
So now I'm here. If you have any questions about that, my formative history, I'm happy to answer them in more detail on the question and answer period. Um, so now the Pride Center. Where is the Pride Center? So like I mentioned, I joined as the operations manager. And the reason they, when they hired for, um, they were looking for a new ED, the, the reason the board had decided to create an operations manager position is they realized that the position, this role really is too much for one person. And so they thought it's a really good idea to divide it into two positions. And there's more um, nonprofits that are doing that. And it does actually make sense to me. And ED's role is, is you, you're, you're doing everything really. Um, and especially in a small organization, our, our, our organization has about a $500,000 operating budget currently and has had that budget for the last number of years. It's incredibly small. And so that means that you really are as an ED, you have to do so many more things. If you're looking at an organization um, that has like a $25 million or a $6 million operating budget, they can, they can cover the cost of having um, an operations or development manager, those sorts of things, administrative staff that can help take the load off the ED. Um, of course, they, they have their own challenges as well. So the family, so sorry, the um, Pride Center. I came as the operations manager um, and a lot of what that period was is looking at um, operational deficits within the organization. Because there was so much transition with executive directors, there was a lot of institutional memory that was lost. Um, things like um, we did, we hadn't had a business license for I don't know how long. Uh, and I discovered that as the operations manager, we were doing renovations at the time and we needed our business license. And then I discovered we didn't have business license. And it's not really anybody's specific fault. I think that with um, an organization that's had such high turnover, it's really hard to have that information transfer from ED to ED. And also with a board of directors that have two-year terms and no real clear direction of where that responsibility lies that's, lies, that's how it ends up not being taken care of and why you kind of need somebody dedicated to taking care of those things. So I spent my time as the operations manager project managing renovations that we had, um, which if you want to come down during our drop-in hours, I'd love for you to see this place. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and then working on all those, those nitty gritty operations pieces, taking care of things like fire inspections, making sure that we have streamlined processes for expenses, um, doing things like um, payroll. We didn't really have a streamlined process for payroll. So doing all those things. And I developed a good relationship with our finance team. And then as an ED, um, it was a lot of the continuation of building on those fundamental pieces of those operational pieces and then doing all the extra things that ED does. So I, now that I've been in this role for a bit, I think the job of an ED ideally is doing a lot of community engagement and getting sustained funding in the organization. Ideally, that's really what you're gonna have an ED uh, focus on, and then you'll have another position to do those those operational pieces or a, a lot of the nuts and bolts of the organization. So where we are right now, what we currently have operating through out of the Pirate Center is we have a partnership with the Family Center, which we've had for a number of years now, and we have a program called DISC, which stands for Drop-In Single Session Counseling. The Family Center has a number of remote locations. The Pride Center is one of them. And what they do is they place a Masters of Counseling intern student who does a four month placement at the remote locations, location. And then they provide free counseling for uh, on a drop-in basis to anybody who wants to access counseling. If they want to continue with counseling, they have an internal system where they can onboard those clients and refer them to the Pride Center. And they, they'll go through a, a full questionnaire. And one of them for us is obviously, uh, they'll want an affirming uh, physician or sorry, affirming uh, therapist. 
And then the family center does uh, a sliding scale or a fee assessment. And they've told me that they don't turn anybody away. And then people can get set up with uh, long-term counseling that's accessible for them. We also have our drop-in hours. So currently they're Tuesdays and Thursdays. And that's where we do um, a big thing that happens or one of the major things that we've done is information and referral, but it's supported information and referral. So if somebody is calling about finding affirming housing, um, we have a list and we'll give out or finding an affirming doctor. We have a list that we'll give out, but a lot of folks, they need supported access to resources. So in addition to giving that information to them, we also have contacts with many different organizations and we'll either directly connect connect them with workers or those workers will make appointments and bring them into the Pride Center um, so they can get access to various resources. That's everything from people um, that are experiencing family violence, housing insecurity, um, food insecurity, you, you name it. There's a ton of, ton of different things that come up. Um, community connection, obviously, in our drop-in hours. So we have the largest queer library in um, Alberta, which is run entirely by volunteers. And we now have quite a robust youth section and then a section for little kids as well. Um, we do youth programming. So we've been doing that since 2011. And it's really kind of in its been operating in its current form since 2018. And that's where youth youth is defined as anybody from 13 to 24, although we don't turn anybody away. Um, but that's generally the group that, you know, it, when they age out, um, this is as a side note, a lot of agencies, what happens is you have these youth that age out and there's no real transition process from when now they're not a youth to adult serving or adult programs or services. So we make sure that 24 is not a hard line. That's why we expand it. And the youth programming, uh, we had to really change it during the pandemic. So they became really versed, the youth program coordinators became really good at operating a, a system called Discord. And that's where youth come in every week and they can meet up on a, like it's kind of like a chat line and they've got different rooms that they can set up with different activities. And they bring it, yeah, they do everything from bringing in speakers to doing board games, like online board games. One of the favorite activities is called chill chat. So that's just a time for, for the youth to connect. And then since we've reopened uh, after the pandemic shutdown stopped, we, they've been doing about one day a month in person. So we just had one last night where they did karaoke. And um, we have it on Wednesdays because we're not open to the public. And that way the youth can have the entire space. They can be as loud as they want. It's really their space uh, where they can feel safe. Um, and then we do this year, we got funding for the next three years, uh, trans and gender diverse program coordinator. The person that's running that program was actually our old youth, youth coordinator. So we have integrated our youth programming underneath that uh, coordinator's role. Mm -hmm. And that is because 99% of the youth that come in, they are, they do identify as gender diverse. We're really not seeing a lot of kids that are specifically coming because of their sexual orientation. And if they do, they can still be involved in the programming. Um, and then the program coordinator, the trans and gender diverse program coordinator is also tasked with onboarding or starting up support groups. So the Pride Center histor historically has had a number of groups meeting in the evening. And what happened is once the COVID-19 shutdowns happened, they obviously all stopped. And then since then, it's been really difficult to restart groups. We've been open to folks. We've reached out to previous group members to say, can you, can you start a group up, group up again? People really want it. Um, and then another thing that happened is that we had some groups that became very dysfunctional. And that was just the nature of um, the complexity of trauma and issues that would come up within those group meetings. And so the program coordinator, the trans and gender diverse program coordinator, um, what they're tasked with doing is restarting some specific groups for some of those, those, those groups that were having a lot of dysfunction within the group. 
with some institutional support. So we don't have capacity to run groups, but we do have capacity to work on some framework and um, backend support to vet um, facilitators, um, gather some external mental health support so that those run those groups can run a little bit more um, sustainably. And then we also have a gender affirming uh, clothing program. So that is a combination of something we've run for a while, which is it started as a binder exchange program. So that's for people that want to reduce the presence of a chest. Um, and we started with just getting old binders, uh, gently used binders, and then creating a library. And anybody who, who wanted a binder could request one free of charge. Then um, we got, during the pandemic, we were able to uh, get money for gift cards. And that's relevant because a lot of funders don't like giving money for gift cards, but because everything was shut down, they, they were allowed us to do that. And so we got quite uh, about a, a bunch of gift, uh, quite a large catalog of gift cards for um, the quilt bag, which is a uh, uh, LGBTQ store in Edmonton, and then the tickle trunk as well. Um, where they sell binders and other gender affirming wares as well. And so if, if people can't find a binder or they want a gender affirming wear that we don't have, then we will give them gift cards and they can go and get whatever, whatever it is they need. Then what we're adding to, so we've been doing that for a number of years, what we're adding to um, for the gender affirming wares program is a clothing exchange room. So it's an actual room that we have set up. It looks a lot like um, like a thrift store. Um, so people donate old clothing. We also have um, bought new undergarments. And then we have uh, toiletries and things and makeup and a vanity in there as well. So people can access both the, the wares or the hygiene products, but also for people that don't, they don't have an affirming place where they can put on makeup or 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 whatever clothing it is, so they can change here and they can get ready, whether it's for work or, or go somewhere else, or if they just want to explore. Some people that are exploring their gender identity, they really, um, they want a safe space to start testing the water. So being able to change and then just be in the Pride Center, which is an affirming safe place, they can do that as well. Um, and then we also do a lot with, um, newcomers, but specifically refugees. And that's through our relationship with uh, EMCN, Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers, and the LGBTQ Newcomers Group. So some of you might have um, seen Sarah and Bessel. They're the two settlement workers at EMCN. They did a presentation last year. If you're not familiar with them, um, Sarah and Bessel, they work officially for the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers. Um, but their funding for that work actually only covers people that are protected persons or beyond. And a protected person is somebody who has a successful uh, refugee claim. So they have an official status. And then beyond that is a permanent resident um, or citizen. Refugee claimants, they're in this place where they, they're, they're undocumented, basically. They have no official designation, and it's a really, really vulnerable position for um, LGBTQ plus asylum seekers because the traditional avenues of support for those people would be things like churches or their cultural communities. And these are people that are fleeing countries that they are not safe to be who they are. So they are usually not connected to their cultural communities here. And most churches are, do not feel safe for people. So they're really reliant on the resources that exist through community organizations or um, what Sarah and Bessel do, which is this LGBTQ newcomers group. And that is something they volunteer with on the side. They started that group um, basically for a need for a community connection. Um, and then they realized quite quickly through those community co connections, a lot of the folks going to that group were refugee claimants and they would say, these are things that I need. I don't have food. I don't, I, you know, there, a lot of people are uh, mentally, they're struggling quite a bit because of the extreme levels of trauma that they've experienced. And so um, 
Sarah and Bissell, they take their knowledge from the paid work that they do, and then they run this volunteer group um, and kind of tie it all together, but remembering their funding actually doesn't cover that group. So that's one of the areas that we come in. Um, it hasn't been official, although I'm working to make it more of official partnership where we help fill in those gaps, creating community support, offering um, space um, and finances when we can to help the group out. Um, the LGBTQ newcomers group, they meet, they've met almost every week actually since 2017. Um, doing various things. They make food, they go bowling, like you name it. Um, and then we also write support letters for refugee claims. So when there's a person making a refugee claim here in Canada and they, they, are, um, they have an appeal to, they have to go to the refugee board and they have to state their case. So they have to prove that they are legitimately in danger and also prove that they are part of the queer community because there's this there is a, a narrative or a suspicion that sometimes people are pretending to be part of the community. So we write support letters validating that, yes, they are part of the community. Um, we give them membership cards. So they actually became Pride Center members. And anytime they come in to visit, we actually have a file for each person who is um, preparing for their refugee claim. And we mark down we make a record every time they come and why they're here and then we initial it and we provide that with the documentation for when they're they're doing their uh, their refugee claim. So that's what we're doing now. Where are we going in the future? Um, when I moved into the role of interim executive director, I one of the first things that I thought we needed to do was create some clarity about what the Pride Center does. So we've existed as an organization in some form or another since around 1971. Um, at one point, we were the only organization, the only 2S LGBTQIA serving organization. Now there's a number of organizations in the city and also integrated within larger organizations, um, things like the Rainbow Refuge pro Program. So we've got people dedicated to serving members of the LGBTQ plus or the 2S LGBTQ plus community within other organizations. So there's a lot more resources. There's a lot more support. There's a lot more visibility. And um, there's also the umbrella is a lot bigger than it was before. And by virtue, I think partly of our name and our, our historical memory, many people see the Pride Center as this sort of catch-all, like, like our name indicates. We are the, we, we kind of serve everything under the 2S LGBTQIA plus umbrella. And that is, it's too big an umbrella to address all those concerns. It's too much for one organization, nor do I think one organization should. Um, and so what I started doing right away when I moved into the interim role is to figure out and start working on how do we actually tailor our services and become more focused so we can do a better job of meeting the needs where there are there are needs. Um, and so the way I approached that was I found a consulting company and contracted them and got some funding to do a strategic plan. Um, I have shared the strategic plan with Jan. I believe she put it in the chat or she will and or you can contact her later on and she can send you a pdf document if you want to see that if you come I really, in i really tried to put it in the chat but the account is limited it, it's the account admin won't let me send a pdf okay if people want to throw their email addresses into the chat i can send it out while you're speaking sure. yeah that would be great thanks jen um and then if you want to come into the pride center too i can print one off for you as well um, anyway, so that strategic plan. So um, I contracted this company to help us do a strategic plan, which involves figuring out what we're doing, community consultations, um, and then also just a, a funding and an operational plan too to make things more sustainable for everybody involved. So we've started on that, um, but rather than doing just general community consultations, taking my own experience, 
uh, the experience of staff. And there's uh, a number of staff that have been here for a while, either as staff or volunteer or students. And then um, we were able to identify kind of who are the target groups that are largely accessing the center and who we are best positioned at this point to serve. And so we identified um, youth, trans and gender diverse folks, and then refugees and newcomers, LGBTQ plus refugees and newcomers, um, because we're basically already doing that work and that's where we have the greatest level of expertise so we can really um, grow or we can really capitalize on that work um, and then um, hopefully grow beyond that. But that that's where we have the greatest level of expertise right now. And then they are some of the, the most vulnerable group members. There's obviously other uh, members, members of the queer community that are really vulnerable as well, um, but that's where we're best positioned to serve. So if you look at the strategic plan, the first step is community consultations with those core groups. And then the next step is the findings from what comes out of those, those community consultations will be brought to the, the larger community so they can um, give their feedback and then they'll be going to their next stage. So that is going to influence what programming looks like at the Pride Center moving forward. Um, It'll help me in applying for funding so we can apply for some more targeted funding, sustained funding, get some sustained programs that are more than a year or two. Um, and then if there's some stability there, we have more operational funds. So operational or unrestricted is, is money that we can just do what we need to with, um, then we can potentially grow, but we need to start start there and do do a better job of serving the communities that the people that are accessing the center right now um so yeah that's the that's the synopsis of where things are at and i think this is a good place to transition transition and then have some conversation i was very impressed sg i didn't see you look at any notes anywhere that's just came straight from your heart <laughs> it's very moving <laughs> Does anybody have any uh, comments or questions for us, Jay? I see Larry has put up his hand. Larry, please go ahead. It's perhaps uh, more than a comment than, um, than a question, uh, but there will be a specific question. And that is, we have political representation at least at the federal level uh, of, um, uh, members of parliament who are in the queer community. Um, uh, are you, can you talk anything about your connections um, uh, with, uh, with them? The, but the comment that I wanted to make was your, your personal story at the beginning. If you go back 20 years earlier, if I go back 20 years earlier, it sounds like my story. The complete absence at that time of any information, the fact that being queer was certainly not respectable. Indeed, it was criminal, it was evil, it was a whole lot of other things. And I think a message that we can give to the, the trans component of the queer community is, is how to get through that and and how to persist uh, and and finally win. We've obviously got a long ways to go, but the I suspect that many of the younger generations, for example, that we met at McEwen, I'm not sure they even re truly understand what it was like to be queer in the 50s and 60s, and what from your story, what it was like to be uh, in the trans community a lot more recently than that. Thank you very much for uh, a moving and informative talk, uh, SJ. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. Um, I'll answer your first point about the your first question, and then I had a thought about your comment. Uh, my connection, I have connected with Randy Boisno's office. So I had a meeting with um, him and then his, um, his assistants. And um, there were HIV, Edmonton was at the meeting, Edmonton Two-Spirit Society, uh, 
Um, is there anybody else there? There was a representative from, um, I can't remember. Actually, she's on our board, but she they wanted a Francophone representative, so she wasn't actually representing her board. She was just representing, uh, she was just Francophone representation. And um, the Salem, which um, helps support um, Muslim LGBTQ plus folks. And so that meeting was, it was actually at Randy's request um, to help bring us together as queer serving organizations. And he is really invested in Edmonton having a basically a coordinated effort. So he said in other cities, they've done a really jo good job of creating sort of a hub network, which has really helped um, with communication between organizations and then also with getting more money into the various organizations. So like I said, our operating budget's $500,000. A lot of these other ones are very small as well. And it's very difficult, I feel like, to get any traction without having some more funds coming in. Um, and then you're always caught in this loop of, you're so busy, it's really hard to kind of get out of, out of that space. Um, and so his suggestion at that time was actually that sort of the Pride Center, it's done under, uh, we, the Pride Center is not at the top, but it's there sort of central to this hub. And um, I'm sure many of you are familiar that the Pride Center has really had a difficult time publicly in the last few years. It's it's come out of under a lot of public pressure and there's been so much transition and there's been a lot of trust within members of community. So there was a real resistance from other groups. The other groups there saying, well, like we don't really want the Pride Center to be at the head of that. Um, and then, so that sort of stopped there. Um, but he also said, he did a round table and asked everybody, what, what do you want? What can we do for you? And, and he gave each of us a chance to talk. And I had said, Randy, the thing is, is you know, our funds as any nonprofit, queer serving or not, it is so difficult to get sustained funding and funding without all these strings attached. So those of you that aren't familiar with grant streams, which is where a lot of our funding comes from, I would say the vast majority of grants are very, they're project-based. So they have a very definitive start and end. There's often a caveat that it's doing something different than what you're doing. And it doesn't, they usually don't cover many operational funds. So operational funds are things like your rent and your lights, but it's also in min staff and it's my wage as well. So with an organization like us, now I'm trying to cover my wage and my men's staff and arguably everybody's role is really important. But if you don't have a stable leader and you don't have stable front end staff, like you're in men's staff and you can pay them reasonable compensation, it's very difficult to create any sort of stability. So I had said, is there, do you really have any power to influence the type of funding we're, we can get? And can you help us get sustained operational funding and funding also that sustains what we're currently doing. So we're not always constantly trying to reinvent the wheel and pigeonhole what we need into what we're doing. And what he had said is, um, yeah, come and meet with me. You can meet with my assistant. It's actually just as good as meeting with me and let's, let's have a conversation. So that was, I wanna say that was summer last year, kind of around Pride Month last year. Um, my board chair was there as well. So after that meeting, I'd said to her, let's, we need to talk with Brandy. And she had said, let's have a really calculated, let's have a really calculated message, go in with what we want to do. And then um, the year passed and it was still on my brain. Um, and at the end of the year in December, when I was going through all my notes and things to people to connect with, and I was able to look back at the previous year, Randy's office was still on my list. And I also had a much clearer idea of what I wanted to do. So I actually reached out to his office when I was preparing for my winter break to set up a meeting. And I am going to be meeting with them next month to further discuss what we can, what we can do. So that's my relationship at that point with, uh, with the feds. Um, and then you asked specifically about the federal government, provincial government. We're in this weird spot with the provincial government, right? Because we have an election coming up right away. Um, I have met with Janice Irwin and David Shepard, and I actually had a meeting 
um, last week with a re representative from the UCP. They have a position where um, it's somebody who's a community relationship, um, community relations something, community relations something, that's their title. But he is, he is uh, part of the community and he said, I really wanted to reach out to you specifically and some other queer serving organizations. And it was a good meeting. I was very candid. Um, I'll be candid with you as well. I, I'm really concerned about specifically UCP leadership and, um, and then a number of policies uh, within underneath their, uh, a number of their policies. Um, but I also really think it's important that we're having conversations with people that seemingly, or organizations that seemingly have different ideas. Um, and that ultimately, if they are the government in power, I have to have a good relationship or some sort of working relationship with them. So um, it was a really good conversation. His position will not be there if they don't, if they don't get in. So I'd said, well, we should probably meet up later on and see what happens um, after, after the election. But it, I have spoke to some other organizations and they said he has been good at following through on the things that, uh, he has agreed to. So, um, it, it actually felt really good afterward. It's really nice to sit with people, um, especially with the UCP where they are right now and feel like I had a real human connection and I wasn't just speaking to somebody toting the party line. And then in terms of that piece, um, the one thing that really stuck out to me, Larry, is I, I've always had a, a real fond fondness for seniors, period. Like I said, when I was older or when I was younger, I, I wanted to be, wanted to be a senior. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents as a, I was a kid, so I've really felt a connection, that intergenerational connection. And as I am now, you know, I'm actually considered an elder in in trans community because there's so many losses and there's not a lot of people that explored uh, are aware of their trans identity um, when they were younger. So many people come out later in life. Um, and I'm just personally really interested in queer history. I do really agree. I think a lot of younger to us LGBTQ plus people, they might know it on paper, but they don't really understand or they haven't taken the time to really understand how, how difficult it is, how many hardships and we're hard fought and where we are right now, there is a ton, ton of work to still do, but the protections that we have right now, I were so hard fought. Um, and that is something that it's a shame. And I also think it's just such a loss of, it's a loss of personal history. I think that there's so, it's so important to keep, to, to remember and to acknowledge and also give that due respect to folks like yourself that are still living or those, those that we don't know their names and the many, many people who, who we've lost. And then there are people that are still, they've lived through it and they are still not in a place where they can come out. So, and I also just wanna say thank, I do genuinely think, thank you, those of you that have, that have persevered and have done the work that, that you've done. So thank you. Um, I see Pam has her hand up. Please go ahead, Pam. I'm sorry, you're not Pam, you're Karen. Yeah. Karen, yeah. Um, yeah, I got two questions. Actually, just one comment. I assume that the charitable uh, status is still maintained with uh, Revenue Canada. Yeah. And um, that's good. Uh, the, other, the other question is that when we moved here uh, from Ottawa back in 99, uh, Glicky fell apart because the community had a lot of infighting and there were different groups that tried to take over uh, Glicky at that time, gay and lesbian, uh, Glicky, whatever it was. And it's, so it disappeared really. And then Pride Center of Edmonton started up as a, an incorporated structure, not getting a license, but getting some kind of incorporation documents. I don't know whether those documents are, are updated from year to year. Um, they are, are they? Good. And the other question I had is, to what extent is the Pride Center, as it exists now as, as a incorporation, protected from a, a community coming in trying to have a, 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 a power vote to try to take over an organization? Uh, I, 
the reason was incorporated was to protect it from uh, seasonal changes and having different groups coming in, volunteer groups coming in at different times, basically trying to uh, usurp, do, do a Trump number and take over the company. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, so in terms of operations and in terms of running, running meetings with, and staying so-called, uh, being open to the community and yet at the same time, protecting the company, the, the corporation, the center from being taken over by a, a power group. Uh, I, could you address that issue? That obviously it has survived. So I assume there must be uh, steps in place to um, avoid um, things of that nature that certain personalities may, who want to want to take power, want to take over control, uh, don't run uh, and bully themselves into positions. <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much. Um, so your name's Karen or Pam? Karen, yeah, Karen, yeah. Karen. I, I was on, a number of us actually were, were involved with that first uh, uh, resurrection of the, uh, of the Pride Center and calling it the, uh, the Pride Center of Edmonton Inc. Incorporated. And uh, it was, there were some thoughts behind that, but obviously there were just so few of us trying to do <laughs> so much of us <laughs> and, and throwing in our own money and trying to make things work. It was like, uh, it was desperate, but it had to be done. And um, we tried to get it off the ground and thank God something came of it. So anyway, it's just what kind of, um, in other words, I'm asking, it's an organizational question, but how, is this company, how is this, um, this organization protecting itself from uh, pop populism? Actually, that's what it amounts to. Sure, thank you very much for that. Uh, that's through, I guess, essentially, if you had a group that was determined enough, they could perhaps take over. Um, but it's, that would have to happen, I think, through our membership. So in order to, um, create some checks and balances. We've got our bylaws. And so there's criteria in order to become a member. Yeah. Um, and then you don't just, you have your membership, you pay your membership dues and that's it. There's a code of conduct that you have to sign. Um, so they would have to be coordinated enough to, um, and have enough fortitude to vote board members out. And because board member terms are two years, they're not all coming up for renewal at one time. So this AGM, we had two board members uh, positions that were up for renewal. So they would have to um, they would have to create a stink, and then they would have to not allow those board members to be reelected. Then they would have to um, be elected as board members, and that would there would have to be enough members that would actually vote them in as well. And then so you'd have to do that slowly to get rid of all all the board members. Um, mm -hmm to do that. Um, and then currently right now, our board member, the process to onboard board members is they meet with me first because I have to work, they're my boss and I have to have a good working relationship with them. Um, and they also have to have some skills to, to help support this organization. So they meet with me first. And if I say, yeah, this person's fine, then they meet with the board and they do an interview with the board. And then, sorry, this is outside of an AGM because you can become a more member outside the AGM. And then during the AGM is when you're officially elected or reelected. Um, and then if the board is agrees, then they will be onboarded. So I do think there is enough checks and balances to keep to keep the the institution safe. Yeah, we, we started out by having a membership fee at $300. Mm -hmm. That was to discourage people who thought that five dollars was enough to make it to be a nuisance. Yeah, says, no, you have to be serious about this. It's like you're either in all the way or don't bother. So it's uh, it was a crude way, but we had to do something quickly and to make it work and to only have people come on who were who realized that there was no money there. <laughs> There's yeah. no there there. It was that we need people working, <laughs> and we had to invest ourselves. You know, so that was. That's how desperate it was at that time, 20 years ago. Wow. Anyway, that, that's, just, uh, uh, that's just a concern about uh, the security and the, the welfare of the organization as a whole, that it's not taken over by any uh, particular interest group, but uh, that the, the mission of the organization, you know, with, along with the strategic plan and all that stuff, 
uh, follows a, a business plan and everyone is working together uh, and has that uh, is uh, loyal to the to the mission mm -hmm. and it's not a personality issue it's a matter of of uh, providing service and the services for the community and it's not in order to you know, generate esteem and power and whatever else that people think is involved and they want to uh, it's not a matter of ego it's a, it's a matter of get the work done anyway mm -hmm. that's, that, that's thank you why. for that thank you for that karen yeah. yeah pretty wise words um so we're down to our last four minutes and i see we have some more questions so who from the pride center has put up their hand and is it is it uh michael is it uh eric go ahead please it, it was me just a couple of things uh thanks karen for refreshing that history i was part of that uh, movement at the time as well and it, it was difficult one of the things that your your conversation brought up was and i think this has really come to the fore for me recently seeing a lot of is the concept of lateral violence you see it in very very many marginalized communities where you realize you can no longer punch up so you start punching sideways and i think as we try to make sure that we're a, an inclusive uh, healing community that we need to recognize that and when someone does punch sideways rather than saying ouch that hurt maybe trying to understand the trauma that caused that reaction coming towards you i know it's not it's uh, it's difficult to do but i think uh, at times i hear some comments and i know that those comments are coming from past trauma not from the current situation so i just wanted to give the 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 quick social work inter interpretation thanks very much and aj uh, sj thanks so much and last item is that uh because we have some technical limitations today i will mail out the uh the strategic plan to everybody who is on the line this morning and i will also be mailing out the toolkit from last week's presentation and that's it i uh, i can shut up i hope Thanks, Eric. Um, I did send out the um, uh, strategic plan to Joan. Joan, did you have any comments on that plan? Uh, I'll just check to see if I got it. I wasn't checking okay. my email. Uh, well, I got you on the line though. Awesome story, SJ. I can so relate to so much of what you said and I'm so glad you're there. And if you could, uh, pick something out of the million tasks that you're responsible for, what would you prefer to direct your energies to if you had like more help and stuff? Mm, thank you very much. What would I like to do? Um, like you're doing a ton of stuff, like that's way, that's a pretty big plate you have there, right? Honestly, when I look at it, um, my favorite thing to do is build systems. I really like looking at systems and fixing them. So my my vision, if we could get to a place, is I'd like to get enough money to basically go back to that model where we divide this position into two places and I become like a chief operating officer. And then we have somebody else that does more of the public relations things. I can do that, but I'm naturally an introvert. So I get really exhausted at the end of the day with all the interactions that I have to do. And you have people that love going out, networking, doing that sort of thing. And so it'd be great if I could have somebody send them out, do that sort of stuff. And then we could work behind the scenes, working on grant applications and then systems, fixing systems. That's what I would love. Because my favorite part of it is like last night when we had the youth programming, the systems that I was able to create made this incredible event for the community members and when you have those that systems working well staff are supported uh volunteers are supported and then you see this great community uh this result of community connection thank you thank you so we're down to our our last minute i turn it back over to you sj do you have any events to advertise or any last minute words for us okay events 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 um we will be publicizing if any of you are interested when we do that next stage of the strategic plan where there'll be uh, the community general community con consultation, excuse me, um, that'll be coming up. And then other than that, no, we don't have anything specifically planned for events. 
I just knew we were going to run out of time today. I say we haven't even started on talking about your transition. I, I would love to hear every detail about that. You know what it's like as a younger body versus an older body. I'm, I'm so happy for you because that was even an option for you. It was never for me. It was always shunning. It was always a religious based. It was always, it, it was like horrible. And there was no grandma for me to ever go to. So I'm so happy for you. Um, th thanks for giving me my one second of, of lamentation. And thank you, SJ, for such an inspiring talk. And thank you to all of you. I hope that we will see you next week when we have Angel Sumka, who will discuss sexual health for seniors. You can contact us at agingwithprideyake at gmail. See you all next week. Bye. Thanks so much, Aging with Pride. Thank you. Thank you.